All right, welcome everyone back to another episode of Herbal Prepper Live, where we cover herbal medicine, prepping, and everything in between. So, our show airs live every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific here on PrepperBroadcasting.com, and today is Sunday, February 11th, 2018. It is like almost halfway through February. I can't quite wrap my brain around that. So, For those who are listening live, um, please join us here in the chat room on Prepper Broadcasting. Pop your questions in there, pop your comments in there, or better yet, please take advantage of this being a live broadcast and call into the show. The phone number to do so is 347-202-0228. Again, that number is 347-202-0228. And if you call in, please remember to dial one so we hear when you hear the greeting so that we know that you are on the line. And tonight's guest speaker is disaster prep ex- expert and author Jim Cobb. We're going to bring him on in just a minute. Before we get started, let's just get a little bit of business out of the way. If you're listening over at Blog Talk, come on over and join us here at PrepperBroadcasting.com and join the chat room here. For those who may be new, I have two books available that you need in your Prepper library. One is Prepper's Natural Medicine, which is like a crash course in herbalism, covers herbal skills, 50 different herbs, plus herbal formulas for both acute and chronic conditions. And then there's my second book, Prepping for a Pandemic, which is loaded with critical information that you need in order to survive deadly infectious disease erupting in your area. Both of my books are available in the Prepper Broadcasting Bookshop on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, everywhere books are sold. And just as a teaser for next week, February um, 18th, we are looking at the, um, the flu. We are just about, uh, we're in peak flu season right now, uh, so we really need to have one more flu discussion before the flu season is over. All right, so without further delay, tonight's guest is disaster prep expert and author Jim Cobb. Jim is a nationally recognized authority on disaster readiness, and he has written several best-selling books, including Prepper's Home Defense, and Prepper's Long-Term Survival Guide. So welcome, Jim. Thank you for for being with us tonight. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's nice to, uh, you know, we talked a little bit off the air. You and I have known each other for quite some time. You know, we're both published by the same publisher, and we we travel in a lot of the same circles, and it's nice to actually finally talk, (laughs) use actual (laughs) words. (laughs) I know instead of the the typing and, and I social media email and and all of that. So I know one of these days I'm going to have to you know like make an effort and like get around the country a little bit and start putting you know faces like actual like FaceTime with people too. Um, yeah, that that's one of the things I'm hoping to do this year myself is get out to some of the expos, get out and teach some more face to face classes. And, you know, get to know some of these people who have supported me all this time. And, you know, I talk to them all the time on Facebook and other social media. And it, it's really nice to actually get out there and, you know, get face-to-face with somebody and go, oh, that's what you look like. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So um, why don't we start off? Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you became interested in disaster press and and survivalism and all of that how where where did that start well it it started at a very young age um at one time i may have been one of the youngest quote-unquote preppers there was when i was maybe 10 at the oldest i started paying closer attention to the news reports of severe weather, things like that. You know, back in the day, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have social media. It was, you know, you'd hear the tone over the television, the television that was never turned off, by the way, back then. I mean, it was on 24-7. Um, <laughs> the only time you turned it off is when you heard the, the the music at the end of the night. When you heard the anthem playing, it's like, okay, it's time to turn it off, and then in the morning you turn it back on. Um. Back then, you know, I I grew up in Wisconsin, and while it's not Tornado Alley like Oklahoma, we had a lot of severe weather, particularly in the winter with bad blizzards and then in the summer with bad uh, thunderstorms and that. Whenever I would hear these tones come over the TV, I'd get very concerned. You know, oh, my gosh, you know, what what's going on? What's going to happen? And 
my parents kind of blew it off like a lot of people do. You know, you, you hear these storm warnings so often that they just kind of go in one ear out the other. Well, I decided to take it upon myself to make sure that nobody was going to die on my watch. And <laughs> I decided, you know, when, I, when I'd hear those tones, I'm going to gather all kinds of supplies and put them in the basement just in case it really turns into something. Now, being as young as I was, the supplies were a little eclectic. I mean, there were a few cans of soup, but no can opener. Uh, my teddy bear and a pillow and, you know, dog food for the dog. But, yeah, and my parents, uh, to their credit, they humored me. I mean, my I can remember my mom having to, you know, take everything back out of the basement and put it back where it goes and, you know, kind of chastise me a little bit. But I think my parents understood that it wasn't anything, I wasn't being naughty. I wasn't, you know, trying to act out. I was just, it made sense to me to want to be prepared in case something happened. And it was right around that time that I got involved with Cub Scouts and, you know, their whole be prepared thing. Um, so it, it, for me, it started when I was young. And then when I got a little bit older, I was in middle school, that's when I discovered disaster fiction and, you know, stories about the end of the world. You know, the first one I read, Empty World by John Christopher, and it was all about a pandemic that sweeps the globe and kills all you know almost everybody except for kids and not even all kids were spared you know only some of them and i was fascinated by this thought of you know gosh a world without parents a world without rules and we can do whatever we want and it kind of just set me on that course you know it got me a little bit further down preparedness path started thinking about okay well what if it's not a blizzard? What if it's something really big? And, you know, all of this is happening in the mid-'80s, you know, right at the height of the Cold War and all the saber rattling between us and the Soviet Union. So that played into it as well, you know. And it was just kind mm -hmm. of, you know, in a way it was like a perfect storm where all of these different things kind of came together and kind of pushed me to where I am today. Yeah, you know, I, I I remember some of that. I remember the you know the, having the TV on all the time and the uh, the alerts, you know, the emergency alerts, and you know, uh, you know, you just kind of always assumed, oh, they're just they're doing another test, they're doing another test, they're doing another test, you know, and and I'd kind of sit there and go, well, maybe this one isn't going to be a test. Do you ever think of that? Not that yeah. it's like you know we're ready for anything, but. Um, you know, just in case, you know, I'm always, I was always listening to that, but, um, anyway, so this, uh, it's, it's interesting because my son just, um, he had his first, uh, Cub Scout ceremony today where he got his first badges and pins and things like that. Oh, so, cool. So, yeah, he's, um, he's getting into it at a young age too, except that he does have the internet and he'll come up to me with, you know, these, like, oh, my gosh, Mom, I just saw this video. And you know the kinds of videos that are out there about disaster on YouTube? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, it's like, and I have to sit there and go, oh, honey, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, trust me, this is Mom's day job, really. You know, that's, uh, no. And he's like, yeah. so there's, there's some of that going on. It's like, and how did you even find that video? Like, you were in there just, like, watching, you know, some silly cartoon thing a moment ago. How did that even come up? But who knows? Um, anyway, so it's just it's it's interesting to see uh, see some of that. So anyway, obviously this 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 was something that sparked when you were a kid, but this became a full time career. So how did how did that you know how did you go from you know being interested to that to saying hey you know this is something I'm dedicating my life to here? Well, it's interesting. I kind of kept to myself for the most part throughout, you know, my childhood, young adult, you know, got married, started a family. I, I kind of kept stuff close to the vest in terms of the, the prepping part of my life. I would talk about it with family and friends, but that was it, you know. And it wasn't even so much the, the dreaded OPSEC and God help you if you breathe a word of this to anybody. It was <laughs> just, it, it just didn't come up, you know. And I'll never forget I'm sitting in my office one day. At the time, I, I worked as a full-time private detective. 
did that for a long time. Sitting in my office one day in between assignments, and I decided to go. I, there, does, It's not really active anymore, but there was this uh, precursor to social media called Yahoo Groups where oh, I it, you know it was like an it was an email list essentially where you know you could interact with people by email and I was active on some private detective related yahoo groups cuz back then I mean that was that was our facebook that's how you got to know everybody I decided well I wonder if there are any out there devoted to survivalism because that's you know something I'm interested in and lo and behold there was a whole ton of them I joined a few of them and just kind of lurked for a while, you know, see what the groups are about, see who's who and what's what. And gradually I started, you know, putting in my two cents here and there. And I I kind of got to know a lot of the people who were seen as kind of authority figures in these groups. And, you know, I paid very close attention to things that they would say and books they would recommend and other resources and that. And keep in mind, I mean, at that point, I've already been into the prepping thing for about 20 years, you know. So I I had some knowledge to share, and I, you know, would interject here and there, well, wait a minute, you you don't want to do that, let's do this, and well, here's a product I like, and I kind of just, I don't want to say that I took over, because I didn't, but I i started fielding questions from people. People started asking me for my input and my advice, and at the same time, I'd been a writer all my life. You know, I I, I enjoyed it. It was something I, I felt I had at least some degree of talent with, and I had had several people in my life try to push me towards giving writing an honest shake. So, you know, I talked about, you know, my wife and I would talk about it off and on. And finally she said, do it. Give it an honest try and see what happens. So it was right around that time that I had read um, Scott Williams' book, Bug Out, which was published by Ulysses Press. I reached out to Scott and said, you know, I really like this book. It, you know, you did a wonderful job with it. And I'm wondering, how do you like your publisher? Because I'm thinking of pitching a book, and I'm kind of doing some publisher research. He said, I love them. They're great to work with. I've never had a problem with them. Go for it. So I had an idea in my head of what I wanted to write. I approached Ulysses. And I approached a few others, too. They weren't the only one. Uh, but I approached you, Lizzie, said, here's what I want to do. And, I mean, I had gone out online and, you know, figured out the template for a full-fledged book proposal, what is all supposed to be in this massive thing, you know. <laughs> and I I followed it to the letter. I mean, the book proposal, I think it ran like 22 pages or something. It was just ridiculous. It really was. <laughs> And I sent it off, you know, and I think it was Keith who originally responded to me. No, it wasn't. Oh, I can't remember her name now. But the 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 public or the editor responded back, said, you know, we're going to take a pass at it, but we really like your approach and we like your writing style. We'd like to, you know, work with you. We just need to come up with the topic. For the next several months, we're bouncing ideas back and forth. Well, what about this? Well, what about that? What about this? Finally, Keith Riegert was the one who said, let's do a prepper security book, uh, a home defense book. I said, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, I've, I've been doing security and stuff like that for several years. Let's run with it. And I put the book together. I turned it in on time. They liked it. Everybody liked it from you know who read the the advanced stuff. We uh published it and 
it spent close to four years as the number one best-selling book on Amazon on the in the home defense category. That's pretty amazing. It really is. Tell me about it. I have the book, by the way. <laughs> it's a great book. So, by the way, so I'm letting everyone know listening to this. I have it. It's a really good book. You should go get it if you don't have it. So, how many books did you have you published so far? You've got a bunch. I'm at nine books right now. Eight of them were with Ulysses, and I had one that I did with another publisher. Um, I'm working on book number 10 right now. I'm hoping, praying to have the manuscript complete by the end of this month. Wow. That's a lot. Nikki, can you say what the, what the topic is on that one? Uh, the new one, it my most popular book by far has been Prepper's Long-Term Survival Guide. And that was the third book I did with Ulysses. And everybody, I mean, not everybody, because there's always, you know, people who don't like a book. But the vast majority of people who have given input about it have enjoyed the book immensely. So we decided we were going to do a follow-up, and that's what I'm working on for about the last year and a half, putting together the the sequel, Prepper's Long-Term Survival Guide Number 2. Wow. Wow. Well, we're definitely looking forward to that. But you 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 haven't just been you know a prolific author with this. I mean, you you've been involved in a bunch of other things too. Um, let me see. There was um, there was a training CD series that you were involved in. Um, was it? Um, I've seen the website. Detail Productions. Yep. Yep. Uh, Panio Productions brought me in on a series of DVDs they were putting together called the Make Ready to Survive series. Um, the 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 focus was kind of a soup to nuts approach to preparedness. We wanted to cover a, a little bit of everything from basic food and water storage all the way to firearms and tactics and. Uh, even some wilderness survival, that kind of thing. Fernando, the the head of Panio Productions, and I had not heard of them prior to this project, but apparently they're fairly popular with the uh, the tactical crowd. They do a lot of firearms training and um, tactics and that kind of stuff, which isn't really my wheelhouse. So I I wasn't familiar with them when they approached me. He sends me an email just out of the blue and says, you know, here's who I am, here's my company, we want to do this series of DVDs, and we'd like you to be one of the instructors. Are you interested? Well, yeah, I'm interested, but tell me more. You know, what exactly are you trying to do? Over the next few months, Fernando and I kind of hashed out what we wanted to cover in the series, and then they flew me down to Florida for a week to spend in uh, Central Florida in middle mid August, which was loads of fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, oh. when the moment you said Florida, I'm like, oh, what time of year was that? Mm. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty brutal, uh, but thankfully it was only about three days outside and then three days inside, so it worked out okay that way. Um, but we filmed for a week, countless hours of, of video that they then edited down, and then they went out and filmed with other instructors, uh, Dave Canterbury, um, Kyle Harth, and I'm drawing a blank on the other guys. I haven't looked at these for a while. But uh, all good guys, all really know their stuff, put together, I think it's 13 DVDs are in the series. And... It, Honestly, it was one of the most fun projects I've ever done. It really kind of, it was my first experience being on video for a length of time like that. I mean, I'd screwed around with YouTube a little bit, but this is this is a professional film crew with, you know, multiple cameras and lights and everything else. It was my first experience with that. Um, but we had a lot of fun with it. We had a good time, great group of guys. And the the end result, I was very proud of. No, that's a good thing. So, 
you have a very practical approach to being prepared. Um, you know, I mean, you, when when you read your books, it's you know, I mean, there's there's a uh, practical is the word that comes to mind. Very um, down to earth. You know, I mean, you you solutions oriented. Um, what kind of advice would you have for someone who's just starting on this? I mean, you've been doing it for a long time, but someone is now just suddenly realize, oh, you know, uh, you know, maybe my job isn't as secure as I thought it was, or maybe the economy isn't as good as they say it is, or maybe whatever, whatever it happens to be. Um, what, what do you say to them? First things first, you can't do it all at once, so don't try. I see it over and over and over where, they catch the prepping bug, so to speak, and they want to go hell bent for leather to, you know, get six months worth of food and water and first aid kits and, you know, all this stuff, and they become very overwhelmed very quickly. The best approach or the one that I recommend is take it one step at a time, remember to breathe and realize that you're not going to be able to do it all overnight. Just work on trying to do one thing every day. It doesn't have to be anything huge. It doesn't have to be, well, my one thing is going to be to go out and buy a pallet's worth of mountain house. That's ridiculous. Your one thing could be spending an hour reading a book or researching a topic and, you know, kind of putting together your own game plan. Another thing that people often, they don't realize, is every preparedness plan should be unique because everybody's circumstances are different. Yes, we all need food, we all need water, we all need shelter. But how we're going to accomplish those goals is different for everybody because we all come to the table with a different set of circumstances, with different experience levels, with different skill sets. And all of that needs to be incorporated. All of it needs to be taken into account as you decide how you're going to formulate your plan. We're not all prepping for the same thing, you know. And there's there's no right or wrong way to approach it other than to take your time and use common sense. You know, the one of the biggest struggles that I've had over the years is trying to get people to use that thing that sits between their ears for something other than a hat rack. <laughs> you know, apply logic, apply common sense, and if it sounds ridiculous, it probably is. It, it, yeah, it <laughs> It, there's a lot of stuff that that um, that gets tossed around out there, and lots of claims, and lots of theories, and lots of stories and such. Um, I see it both with the prepping world and with the herbal world. I just did a um, I just did a little YouTube rant or video on. If anyone knows me, I, I have this issue with people who get these health um, take their health advice from memes on Facebook. Uh, uh-huh. Especially the, the natural health ones, and there's this there's this one with a sock and an onion, and you slice an onion, and you put the onion on the bottom of your foot, and you put the sock over it, and it's supposed to you know suck all the toxins out of your body, yeah. and 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 it's going to cure the flu, and it's going to cure plague, and oh, it's going to cure everything, and it's like <laughs> they treat it like it's some kind of a strap-on liver, external liver that's on the bottom of your foot, and it's like. Well, you know, just for a second, consider that that's not how the body detoxifies. First, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a liver involved, there's uh, elimination involved, there's sweating involved. But, you know, I mean, if anything, the sock making your feet sweat is, is helping you detoxify more than an onion there. The only, the only thing the onion's doing is making your foot smell like an onion. But um, yeah. it's, it's like, why did the brain shut off there? Or... And then someone had responded to it saying that um yeah that they that they um had people tell them that um we absorb toxins through our feet. And I'm like, really, through our shoes? <laughs> What's all this happening? 
I mean, I, I understand the skin, you know, the skin has pores, all the, all the skin everywhere in the body has pores and, and could, have tech, I, mean, I guess, theoretically absorb something. But, I mean, they're like, oh, we, we absorb most of our toxins through our feet. I'm like, I don't know what shoes you're wearing, but you might want to change it if that's the thing. <laughs> so I don't know, but you're right. I mean, but, so I, I, I kind of ranted on YouTube about it. So go there on YouTube and watch it, please, and, 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 and laugh and, and enjoy my frustration. So, um, but anyway, yeah, it's just like why, why does the, the, the gray matter, why, why does the brain just sort of like take a vacation and, and we suspend disbelief, you know, over some really ridiculous things? Oh, yeah. You know, and it ex- it extends beyond the survival, the prepping, the herbals. I mean, it's just all these different memes that you see on social media that people just blindly share over and over and over because it happens to agree with their preconceived notions and their bias. And, you know, there are a couple of people who follow me on Facebook, and because they follow me, I see their posts. And, I mean, some of this, it's just ridiculous, the stuff that they share. I mean, it's like, really? That's what you think? Go away, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I've, as I've said before, I am really not a fan of the human race, and I understand (laughs) the irony of entering into a career where my focus is trying to save as many people as possible. (laughs) <laughs> you're not the only one because I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I have my people I have like these are my people and they all kind of get me you know and they sort of you know they, they understand you know okay this is Kat she's got her weirdness and you know that's her and, and they've got their weirdness and I'm okay with that but then there's like that general population out there and, and you know I I can't help it I mean I care but I get so frustrated at the same time and it's like Come on, you got to meet me halfway here. Come on, let's let's. You, let's you talk to some of these people, you you see their posts, and it's like, how do you not fall down more often? How do you? <laughs> how does this work? You know, um, you know, and I'll do that. I'll I'll, I'll call my wife over. Here. You got to read this, you know, because <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Some of this stuff, you know. One of my personal pet peeves, and anybody who's followed me on social media for any length of time has probably probably heard this already. One of my big pet peeves is the so-called solar still, okay? And it's this idea that if you're stranded in the wilderness and you need water, you dig a hole roughly three feet across, three feet deep. You put a bucket in the bottom of that hole. You cover the hole with plastic, and you weight it down on the edges so the plastic stays in place, and you take a small rock and put it in the middle of that plastic right above the bucket so that the plastic kind of slopes down over the bucket. And then water is going to condense on the bottom of that plastic over time, and it's going to travel down. It's going to drop into that bucket. You come back few hours or even the next day and you got a bucket full of water for your all your trouble the reality is it doesn't work it, it not anywhere near what a lot of these manuals would suggest that it does in most circumstances you're going to expend far more in sweat than you're ever going to gain in water in that bucket you know and i tell people If you're in the bookstore and you find their shelf that has all the survival manuals and you're trying to decide if you want to buy one, take it off the shelf, leaf through it, and see if the solar still is in there. And if the author recommends it as a means of gathering water in the wild, gently close the book back up and put it back on the shelf. That's the test. You know, and I, you have to wonder though, I mean, it's, you know, it it gets frustrating because, you know, you try and you try and get information out there and you see these things pop up and, and that's where the frustration comes in. So, um, because you try so hard to get good information out and there's all this noise, you know, that yep. that seems to garner more attention. Um yep. but anyway, the, but the but I what I would say about it is that this is a perfect example of 
you can't just read this stuff. You've got to test it out. Make sure that yep. the person who wrote it, you know, I mean, that that they that they didn't just write that they're just excuse me that they're not just passing along something that they heard works that that they didn't test themselves. Just because it's written in a book doesn't mean that someone, you know, like it doesn't mean that the person who wrote it actually tested that out. Uh, right. Exactly. It's, well, and it's like it's like your world with with herbals. There are remedies that work for these people, but these other people don't seem to respond, and they need to try a different approach. It, it has nothing to do with you know a lack of solid information or a la- lack of practical use. It's just people are different. A, a solution for you know gathering water in the wild might work great for somebody who's in Florida, but if they're over in Arizona, it's probably not going to work. Well, you know, it's the you, same thing with um, a solar dehydrator too, because try that out here in New England um, yeah. in the summer. Try and use that here. It's humid. You're not going to yeah. dehydrate anything. I mean, you can't. Yeah, that that's it's just not going to happen. I don't care how many fans you hook up to that thing, and then at that point, what's the point? But I mean, right. it's it's just not a great option for. I've 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 lived in New England all my life. There's never been a summer here that would have been dry enough to make that happen. Right. Yeah, it's the same here in Wisconsin. I mean, it, we have we have humid summers. It's just the way it is. So what I'm going to do right now, we're going to, before um, any more time slips by, we're going to take a real quick break. We're going to let the station pay some bills, and we will be right back. All right, so we are back, and we're speaking with preparedness author Jim Cobb, and we were talking about, I I believe, uh, keeping your plans realistic, or we, or maybe I was about to get to that. So, um, what what do you think about keeping plans realistic? Well, that's one of the things that I, I try to hammer on quite often when I'm giving classes, or you know, in my books, magazine articles, whatever. For example, everybody, or not everybody, but most people, when they start out with prepping, one of the first things they want to do is get that bug out bag together, and there, I mean, you put in bug out bag contents into Google, and it's going to be like hitting the jackpot in Vegas on a slot machine. It's just going to spin and spin and spin. the The reality is, bugging out for ninety nine percent of common disasters is a bad idea. It's not going to accomplish anything for you. It's not going to benefit you to leave home. I understand there are certain circumstances with certain areas, you know, whatever. As a general rule of thumb, bugging out should be your last plan. It should be your last resort. It shouldn't be your primary option. Why? All of your stuff is at home. You've carefully curated this massive food pantry and untold gallons of fresh water and all these other supplies, and you want to just beat feet at the earliest opportunity and leave all of that behind? That's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes no sense. I, I, I believe that you should have a bug-out bag. Everybody should have a bug-out bag. They should have bug-out locations picked out and all of this. But it's all part of the plan. It, it shouldn't be the plan. And part of it is the, this, you know, this realistic approach to preparedness. If you get winded walking to your mailbox, you're not bugging out on foot anywhere. You're not going to get very far. But yet, I, I see these people at expos. I see them in classes. They they walk in with this bug out bag that is literally as big as I am. I could fit inside this thing, and they can hardly carry it into the room. 
and then they plop it down. And I go, what in God's name is that? Well, it's my boat <laughs> out back. Really? Do you have kids in there? They can walk, <laughs> you know, um, and and they're planning on bugging out on foot for about 185 miles away. They're, they're going to hike 200 miles to this remote cabin somewhere. You're not going to get 18 feet with that thing, <laughs> you know, but they, they've convinced themselves that this is how you get prepared. You buy a lot of stuff and you jam it into the, this giant backpack that you can then point at and go, I'm prepared. No, you're a fool. You need to take a step back, sit down, take a deep breath, and look at this from with a realistic point of view. I teach classes in bug-out planning. I teach classes in assembling a bug-out bag. And the first thing I tell everybody is, this is your last option. This is this should not be your primary, you know, oh, my God, disaster is going to hit. We need to leave. Hurricanes coming? Yeah. Get out of town. Wildfires coming? Yeah. Get out of town. You're not bugging out to some remote cabin in the wilderness. You're going to the Super 8 a few towns away. Okay? <laughs> That's your bug out location is the local motel maybe the next county over so you can spend the night in a nice bed and you can figure out what your next move is. You're not rushing off to the wilderness to live off cattails and Bambi for the next 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we've seen, I, I, we've seen it though. We've, yeah. We've yeah. Seen that. Uh, that that seems to be the plan, or the the bags are so large. It's like, are you trying to take your house with you? Why don't you yeah. just stay home? <laughs> I exactly. mean, it, yeah. I mean, if that if that's what you're, uh, I mean, I know that mine's changed a lot over the years. I will admit to being that that prepper that when they got started, just lost their mind because I came into this very late in things. So this was um, in about 2008. When um, when this was um, January of uh, 2008, my husband lost his job, and he he used to uh, work in the mining industry. He 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 crushed rocks. He made big rocks and little rocks. And he used to operate um, hydraulic equipment, the cranes and the you know the front end loaders and then big big equipment like that. So um, so that was sort of like the the ultimate wake up call at that moment. Um, yeah. And it started off with more of like, a, there's got to be a better way to to get bills paid, and to there's got to be a better way, to, you know, to reduce the expenses and put, you know, make sure that there are lights on, and it's more of a sustainable homesteading thing. But then it kind of went on this, um, it is like this it, trip down the rabbit hole. Because once you start peeling back the layers of how vulnerable everything is, you go, oh wow, I was I didn't know any of that. Wow, okay, <laughs> so then. And then you go, oh, well, I need, like, everything right now because this world could just fall apart at any moment. It's it's taken a while to kind of, you know, get past that initial, like, shock of, wow, I, I didn't realize how very vulnerable literally everything is. So, yeah, I mean, it's – so, anyway, I, I went through that same thing and – you know, it was just, and you know, when when you when you're doing that and you're shopping, and it's like it's shop therapy almost. You know, you go and you you, you either go to your outdoor store or something, go to your camping store. You go to the sports department in Walmart. You go on Amazon, and you just start throwing stuff into that shopping cart, and you feel like you're doing something. You know? Oh yeah. You really oh, yeah. feel like you are making a difference, and you know, went to the Wholesale club, how many things of water can I, you know, put in the basement there? How many, where can I store, where can I stash things within the apartment, you know? So it's just it, like, where, and then it it just spirals. And then afterwards you, you look at it and go, why the hell did I buy that? <laughs> you yeah. know, why yeah. did we spend this money? Oh, my gosh, this is this money. And, and then, of course, after I got a ton of food, I found out I had, a bunch of food sensitivities, and I couldn't eat it anyway. So, yep, um, yep. you know, I mean, I would, look, I mean, if it's an emergency, I'd eat it. 
I would. I mean, I'm not going to throw it out, but I would have made different choices had you know there you know had I you know uh, just taken a step back and and what. So I've been there, and I and you know I mean as frustrating as it is now to see certain things, you know I also relate to it too because you know when that when that kind of grips you, it's like oh my gosh, really? I had no idea yeah. that you know the banking system was this or, or, you know, you start to, you start to peel away the layers of the onion. So, oh, definitely. Um, anyway, we had a question in the chat room about tools. Um, Cindy had said that she'd already replaced all her electric kitchen gadgets, but now she's looking at hand tools. So, you know, we don't have power tools. What, you know, we don't have power for whatever reason, whether that's a weather event, whether that's, you know, maybe hackers on the grid. I'm actually, you know, I mean, I know that, I know that EMP is like a big, you know, you know, if you've ever read, you know, one yeah. second after and all of that. But and and obviously with North Korea doing its thing, it's you know that's a, it's 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 a threat there. So, um, but I I'm personally a little bit more worried about hackers getting to the grid. But that's that's just me. But let's just say something has taken out the grid, whether it's hackers or EMP or weather related or, you know, something. Um, you, you've got to do something with tools. Um, well, what, what kind of hand tools should you have on hand? She says not hammers or hatchets, but um, the, the, like the not so common ones. I, I don't know what those would be. So I'm not, the, that's, that's my husband's department with that. So I don't. Well, realistically, it- you don't need a ton of stuff. You need, and I'm just going to start from scratch, regardless of the caveat that she she issued here. You want to you want hammers, you want saws, you want screwdrivers of different sizes, and you know both Phillips and regular. You're going to want wrenches, metric and standard. You're going to want sockets, metric and standard. You're going to want pliers. You're going to want vice grips. You're going to want C-clamps. But the thing is this. Okay, the grid goes down. What are you going to need the tools for? That's the question you need to answer. Not what tools do I need. It's what am I going to need tools for? Because that is what dictates what tools you're going to need. If the grid goes down right now because of hackers, it's not going to be down forever. We all know this. I mean, regardless of what Hollywood and novelists and even our own, you know, that lizard part in our brain that kind of freaks out a little bit, once you get past all that and you sit and you take a breath and you think about it, the grid's going to come back. It's not gone forever. Yeah, it it's going to be, you know, kind of shaky for a little bit. We're not likely to have to rebuild our entire society one nail at a time. It's already there. We just need to maintain it for a little while until power is restored. So, yeah, you you should have hand tools. Not because you're a prepper but because you live somewhere that you might need to affect repairs yourself. Basic hand tools should be in every home, regardless of whether you're a prepper or a survivalist or just a homeowner. It's just common sense. It's just part of, I, I, I know this sounds kind of, kind of rude, but if you're a grown up, you should have tools. You should know how to use basic tools like a screwdriver and a wrench and a hammer. I'm not saying you need to be able to, you know, tear a car apart down to its individual components and put it back together blindfolded in the dark, but you should be able to replace a light switch. You should be able to, you know, do some of these very common little things that require nothing more than, you know, a screwdriver or, you know, a pair of pliers. Don't worry about going out and buying all of these very uncommon and rare tools because they're not going to do you any good if you don't know how to use them. If you don't know what it's for, you're not going to be able to use the tool. Okay? 
this is this is part of that realistic approach to prepping. Don't put the cart before the horse. Don't think I need to go out and buy all these really rare expensive tools. Think what am I going to need to do if the grid goes down? What would I need to fix? And how would I go about doing that? Once you know how to do the repair, you'll know what tools you'll need. Yep. Yep. Um, and so anyway, she puts in the chat room, uh, she has all the basics, she can use all the basics. So it's, I, I think, you know, again, though, it, 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 what tasks, what tasks are you looking to do, you know, that you, that you may have to, I, I can, I can see, you know, I mean, depending like where, where I live, I'm thinking about, well, I might want to put up, um, I could do this. Certainly, I could do this ahead of time. But if it were me, I'd want to put up some of those um, boards across the door. Um, yeah. Get a, um, I'm trying to think the, the the metal brackets to put up on on the you know on either side of a door, and then you, so you can slide a real solid piece of wood um, in there, and you know hopefully you know hold the door you know to reinforce it. Um, right. I I live in. Oh, uh, I don't live in a in a large city. I live in a small city, but there's no getting around the fact that it's a city. And even though I've got you know my remote location there, I I mean I also get the reality that I'm probably not going. I mean unless we were really you know, you to leave ahead of time and get there, I'm probably not going to make it there. It's just too far of a drive. But I've got aging parents here. Well, I have I have one parent here, and my you know, my husband has family here, so there's. There's reasons why we're still here, but yeah, um, you know, but we got to deal with you know what could happen in a city. I mean, it's just one of those things. So, but I'm sure the tools we might need, um, I don't know about the tools we might need would be different, but um, you know, it's. Uh, but um, I'm thinking that I know that Cindy lives out in a more rural area, at least by the size of her garden. I've seen pictures of her garden, and it's way bigger than mine. So she's got more <laughs> land in my little postage stamp because she's got a heck of a garden that's growing there. Um, so um, just so, so that we don't run out of time, I, I why don't we um, – there's a couple of things. I know, well, one, you've got a new project, a new magazine that um, is coming out. Once, can you tell yep. us just a little bit more about that? The the name of the magazine is Prepper Survival Guide. It should be out probably next week, if not the week after. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where it is right now in the distribution channels that it has to go through. You'll be able to find it pretty much anywhere that has a decent-sized magazine newsstand. Walmart, Sam's Club, uh, Kroger, CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, Bass Pro, uh, Tractor Supply, uh, they're all going to have it. Centennial Media is the publisher. They approached me about four or five months ago. They they wanted to do a, a prepper magazine. They had run across my stuff. They wanted to work with me. They, they brought me on to be editor-in-chief. And I gathered together a few writers who I knew could, you know, really add some great quality. We hammered out a table of contents, got everything written, got all the photos done. It was kind of a mad rush because they they were really excited about yeah they were really excited about the project. I was really excited about the project, and it all just kind of fell together fairly quick. Um, I've I received my sample copies about a week ago, um, so I know it's already been printed. It's just a matter of shipping out to the the different. Dis- distributors who are going to put it out on the stands the the approach that we took was we want to do a little bit of everything so you're going to have stuff in here on bug out bags on bug out planning on food storage water purification uh beekeeping herbal remedies terrorist attacks i mean there's literally there's a little bit of everything that can fall under the the prepping umbrella we're now working on the second issue. I, I have the table of contents almost finalized. I've got to turn that in next week. Um, if I had to guess, 
I would say we're probably looking at uh, April or May for the second issue to come out. I'm also talking with the publisher about doing at least one more uh, new magazine, possibly two new titles. It's really kind of interesting because I, I've written for magazines for a long time, but I've never been the editor. So, that you know, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it, I went back yeah. to some of the editors who I work with a lot at American Survival Guide and Off Grid and Survivor's Edge, and I said, you know what, I get it now. I, I understand, <laughs> well, and I'm, I'm really have to sorry wrap it up for right every. Here. I want to make sure I want to make sure that we get a couple of things in because I've got about two minutes left here. I want okay. to make sure one that people know where to find you. What's your website? You've got it's, survivalweekly.com. Uh, survivalweekly.com. Okay. Survivalweekly. And, and you've got a bunch of classes that that are coming up in um, uh, where, where Wisconsin and Kentucky. They can find them on your website as well. They'll be able to find them on my blog, yes, and we're working on putting together a calendar that we're going to have up on the site where people will be able to see what everything's going on. Beautiful. So I want to thank you so much for coming on the show, and I, 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 I'm i very glad that uh, you've been able to spend some time here with us, and thank you for coming on. I hope to have you back. And for Everyone else who were at the end of the show, remember next week we're talking about flu. Thank you, everyone, for spending your time with us. I hope you got something out of this. This has been Kat, the Herbal Prepper with Herbal Prepper Live, and we will see you again next week. <laughs>